Hey, it's Juck. Juck on Bucks. Juck on Bucks. Fun fact for you, Juck. Nike stock is down 20% since Dorian Brew committed to Oregon. <laughs> Back to your regularly scheduled program with Juck. Let's get it. And I don't think he's going to throw the ball as much as he thinks he's going to throw the ball now that Chip Kelly's on board. And I'm happy about that. More quarterback. Um, the truth is Ryan Day has made a change philosophically. But it's none of those. You all know who wins. LSU is the drunkest fan base in the country. Start. <laughs> Welcome to Juck Hunt Bucks, the weekend show. Thanks so much for joining me, everybody. Appreciate you so much. We are under 60 days till we kick the season. I would say it's sneaking up right on us, but it's been the longest off season I've ever experienced. Of course, I've never had a show where I talk about college football almost every day, so that might have something to do with it. But I think that a lot of you feel the same way too. And I know it's uh it's you know one of the more exciting seasons we've ever had with all the changes. We got the new teams in the Big Ten, the new teams in the SEC. Of course, we got the crazy playoff. I'm most nervous about the effect on the big regular season games. How are they going to feel? Are they going to feel less important because they're essentially no longer elimination games until you lose a couple? Um that was my biggest holdup on the playoff, but I'm embracing it now because obviously I've got, it is what it is now, right? I can only look for the positive in it. Um, also, because I think that uh, we've got a little something different going on at the top of the sport, and I'll get to why I think that is a little later on, but uh, we got a lot to talk to you about. I am filming this on Saturday morning, so I'm not going to talk about Riley Pettijohn. We're about to, uh, we're going to go live here in a couple of hours for Riley Pettijohn's announcement. And I don't want to sit here and wax on about Riley Pettijohn. And then we don't get him. Uh, but the good news is whether we get him or not, Oregon's not getting him, right, guys? Right? Because we thought that they weren't getting Dorian Brew. That was down to four teams. And then they swooped in at the 11th hour. No, I don't think they're even in at all on Riley Pettijohn. But my word, man. Uh, geez. The Corey and Moore, right? Um, you know what? We'll get to that in a little bit. I want to talk to you first about uh, my playoff predictions. So I worked on these quite a while um, and I've got everything set up and I can't tell you how hard it is to commit to those final four teams. Now, I'm putting myself on record here. Obviously, I'm going to have to pull this back up come playoff time and see how I did. So I was very cautious with these picks. And uh, let's recap. I chose the other day who I thought were going to be in the conference championship games. So just to recap, we got Ohio State. Buckeyes win the Big Ten. Absolutely loaded. Biggest questions for the Buckeyes, the offensive line and the quarterback. I think the offensive line being a year older. Uh, five guys got a ton of experience. That's if they start Carson Hensman. If not, we're looking at Tegra Shibola, who is a big, mean road grader. Uh, listen, the dude's got a nice disposition, but he plays like he was bullied as a kid. If you don't believe me, go watch his high school film. I mean, he's a mild mannered dude, plays like an absolute animal. I think Will Howard going to be the starting quarterback, and I think we know exactly what he is. He's a good leader. He moves great in the pocket. He's excellent in the red zone. He's going to struggle throwing downfield outside the numbers. Very good in the RPO game. I think the offense is going to run very good under him with Chip at the helm. And I feel like the Buckeyes are going to win the Big Ten Championship. Whether they win or lose against Oregon early in the season, which to me feels like a coin flip game, and I'm not even ready to call that one. But the Big Ten Championship, I believe, is going to re be a rematch between Oregon and Ohio State. And at this time, the Buckeyes offense is going to be humming, clicking really well. And on neutral field, I'm going to take the Bucks for that to win the Big Ten. Number one seed, Ohio State Buckeyes. All right. In the SEC, Texas, our number two seed. They're going to get the bye. Having lost one game during the regular season, we've already broke them down. We don't need to do it again. But the big games on their schedule, we got the showdown at Michigan. <laughs> you got Red River, and I think they're going to win this year. They got Georgia at home. I think they're going to lose that. And then they got Texas A&M at the end of the season to wrap it up. So excited to get that one back. I wish it was still on Thanksgiving. That was awesome. But the SEC championship game, Georgia's going to be there with them. And Sark's horns are going to upset them. 
Not because they're a better team, but because sometimes the better team doesn't win, just like when we played Georgia the last time. Our number three seed, Utah. The Utes, Kyle Whittingham, got his man Cam Rising back. Six or seven uh, returning defensive linemen. Uh, the absolute nastiest defense in the Big 12 for sure. What an excellent coach this guy is. That team, the physicality Utah plays with, I don't think the Big 12 is ready for at all. Big games include Oregon State at UCF. End of the season, they don't play Kansas this year uh, in the regular season, but I do think they're going to play them in the championship game. Congratulations to Lance Leopold and the Kansas Jayhawks for making it to the Big 12 championship game. Um, they will miss the playoffs narrowly. And our ACC champ, the Miami Hurricanes, again, when I first made this Miami playoff prediction, this was months ago, I made a video, and since then they've added a lot more. I got totally clowned at the time, and now a whole lot of people are jumping on the bandwagon and realizing that Miami is actually the best roster in the ACC. Better than Florida State, better than Clemson. Cam Ward, yes, he's a turnover machine. He's also a playmaking machine with a very good offensive line. Obviously, Mario, an excellent offensive line coach in his own right. Uh, they got some returning starters. They bring in that stud center from Indiana, that transfer that we wanted. Uh, future superstar wide receiver in JoJo Trader. This dude's legit. Veteran Xavier Restrepo. Damian Martinez from Oregon State at running back. They got a future NFL tight end in Elijah Arroyo. Defensive line full of game wreckers. Coached by Jason Taylor. They returned Reuben Bain. They brought in our guy Marley Cook that Larry Johnson tried to get. We couldn't land him in the end. I really wanted that guy from Middle Tennessee State. They did bring in Tyler Barron as well from Tennessee and just a stable of young guys that they got in there. One of them is probably going to pop. Somewhat shaky secondary, and that's really their only question talent-wise. But when we look at the schedule, they start with Florida, and that'll be a big, exciting one. Uh, and then their next toughest games are against Virginia Tech, at Louisville, and then home against Florida State. It's a cakewalk into the ACC, ACC championship for Mario Cristobal if he can get out of his own way. And that'll be just their second time since 2004 making it to the ACC championship game. And uh, their first time winning it as they play Clemson. And Clemson has a bounce back year. Miami's going to beat them, win the ACC. All right, number five, our first team hosting a playoff game, the Oregon Ducks. The Ducks are going to be the runner-up in the Big Ten. They're going to lose to the Buckeyes in the Big Ten Championship. I'm not ready to call what happens in Eugene during the regular season, but I do think the Buckeyes are going to be absolutely ready for that Big Ten Championship. And the Ducks, absolutely going to run roughshod over the rest of the Big Ten. Dylan Gabriel, the real deal. I think this is his sixth season as a starter. Something like 150 touchdowns, 25 picks, 14,000 yards. Just totally legit. The wide receiver crew... Evan Stewart, uh, Treshawn Holden, Tez Johnson, probably the best in the country. Most people think it is. I think by the time the Buckeyes play them, the Buckeyes might be the best, but that's contingent on what J.J. Smith does. We'll see. They've got uh, two NFL offensive tackles, veteran studs in the middle of the offensive line, two very good running backs, veteran defensive front, veteran linebackers, including Justin Jacobs, who went to the same high school as Dorian Brew in Ohio. The secondary is the only really area where it's just like, yeah, I don't know. They got a lot of transfers. They got a first round corner. Like, you know, like if that's the biggest area of concern, this is an absolute loaded roster. Um, it has some depth now. I think it's absolutely a, a potential national championship roster, depending on what they do. Landing has surrounded himself by excellent coaches, and I don't believe that you can fairly saddle someone with the moniker of can't win a big game after he's only been a head coach for two seasons. That's a little ridiculous. Uh, I look for them to uh, win their first round game against the group of five team. And who's that group of five team going to be, that 12 seed? Who cares? I'm not even going to pick it. Let's call it Boise State uh, just because they're one that I can think of off the top of my head. I think it's ridiculous that they are getting an automatic bid into this playoff. They are very rarely ever in the top 12, and there's a reason for that. They're very rarely rarely is a, a top 12 team that is a G5 team. Like, honestly, I know that sometimes they get underranked even when they're good, but the top 12, we're talking serious. To, well, we'll see. Well, I got our 13th team. We'll see. Or, or our 12th ranked team. 
is are they better than the 12th ranked team? Let's find out. Number six, the second team to host a home game, Notre Dame. They're 19 and seven in uh, two years under Marcus Freeman. I'm excited to see the new offensive coordinator. He's the dude from LSU. They got uh, Riley Leonard in. Riley Leonard, I know a lot of people didn't like him when we were talking about bringing in a transfer. Uh, and we were deciding, you know, who we all as a fan base kind of liked. I remember there was a lot of hate on Riley Leonard. I like the dude. I think he's a total gamer. Uh, I think he's going to be really good with them. They got a good defense. I really love Howard Cross, number 56 in the middle of that defensive line that absolutely ate us up when we played them. Dude's an animal, but this is mostly about Notre Dame's schedule. They play eight power four teams, fewest in the FBS. They got two MAC teams in both Army and Navy. And I like that they play the service academies. I think that's cool to give them a really big game, like something to remember about their college football career that time we played Notre Dame. That's cool. But if you're going to play both of them, you cannot play two MAC teams in addition. That's ridiculous. Uh, some tougher games they got on their schedule. They open up the season at Texas A&M, and somehow they're only like one-point favorites against Mike Elko in his first ever game at Texas A&M, which is weird. They host Louisville, who they lost to last year. I think they'll whoop them this year. They also host Florida State, uh, and then they got USC. Now, that USC game might be really fun. Um, either they might be really bad and disappointing, or it might be a big game. Either way, it'll be fun to, to laugh at them or to you know see who's going to make the playoffs. Uh, USC, I'm hoping, loses a boatload of games. We've picked up some new audience, uh, some new fan base members, right? So we got some, we've had Oregon folks for a while. Then we got some Georgia folks. Now we've got some Alabama folks, and they're all welcome. USC fans will never be welcome here at Juck on Bucks. I want nothing but pain for them. Uh, I despise them as a fan base, if you can even call them that. They're totally fake. They don't care about football unless it's something exciting, like a bunch of teenagers. Um, I like that they're coming into the Big Ten. They're going to get absolutely smashed, and I can't wait. I've got no respect for them. And, uh, yeah, that's all I've got to say about that. Oh, they're calling us Ohio. They've clicked up with uh, Michigan fans. And USC fans are calling us Ohio. Absolutely not welcome here at Chuck on Bucks. By the way, uh, I want to talk. Listen, this is not even from my chat. But I do get on with several of the Duck fans. And I just happened to, to snap this the other day. Um, you just said Ohio is lacking at quarterback O-line and believe they'll just walk into Eugene and beat Oregon. Oregon has two quarterbacks who could win or who could start at Ohio one of the best O-lines, and can match Ohio at D-line. Listen, Oregon fans, we're off to a pretty good start as a nice, healthy rivalry. Maybe the way things are supposed to be in a rivalry. Don't, don't, don't act like them, please. Don't start the Ohio thing. Uh, it's just corny. It's not insulting. It, we just laugh at it. It just, it just sounds corny. So that's not one of my listeners. But for my listeners, don't do that, please. Please don't do that. Be you. Don't be them. Uh, anyway, we do have one Michigan fan, and uh, he's allowed. He paid. He paid his way in, so he's allowed for sure. All right, number seven, hosting a home playoff game at Sanford Stadium, the Georgia Bulldogs. Carson Beck, obviously, totally elite. They upgraded at wide receiver. They brought the, uh, the budget Brock Bowers from uh, Stanford in. He's pretty good. They got... The little Etienne brother, I can never remember if it's Travis or Trevor that's the younger one. I don't know. 14 total starters return. That's a lot. They got crazy linebackers, a crazy offensive line, top five defensive line, top five defensive backfield, just a totally complete team. Uh, but the best team doesn't always win, and that's why Texas beat them in the SEC championship. But dogs get the home playoff game. It's going to be off the hook, man. I cannot wait to see that one. And our final. Home playoff game, the number eight seed, State College, Pennsylvania, Beaver Stadium, not named after the animal, named after the former governor of Pennsylvania. Don't get that twisted. They got a new offensive coordinator and Andy, Andy Kultanicki. Going to be a huge benefit for our Ohio boy, Drew Aller. Been a fan of him since he was a high school in Medina. I'm a believer in him. I know a lot of people have tossed him away. But listen, the at the podium after he lost to Ohio State, I don't know how you could not like this guy. Um, it was so like, it hurt to watch, man. It hurt to watch. Uh, I mean, you're going to have to watch the film and really dissect why that was a thing. 
Um, I mean, credit to Ohio State, they did a good job. They were playing a lot of off man and catching, so they were they were able to, you know, kind of sit on some routes and we did a good job of them. We did try to take shots of you like recovering and not not taking the baits. So it's a credit to Ohio State and their game plan that they had and how well the corner their corners played today. Drew, I know you said you probably have to watch the film, but how would you, coming off of it, assess how you play personally? Hayden Saunders is in the back. Sucked. Drew, you've been really successful in your high school career. You were perfect as a starter before today. What last time you felt this way? Uh, probably last high school game. Why was that? Because we lost and we were season is over. I guess the difference, Drew, is that this season's not over. How do you uh, rebound from this? Because obviously it's taken a, a little bit of an emotional toll on you. Uh, I mean, that's the biggest thing. We just, at the end of the day, I mean, obviously it sucks to lose. It's not it's not fun to lose at all. But we, we got to take tomorrow to get better. Um, I mean, we, we can only control what we can control. And, you know, at the end of the day, we have to go out and you know what did we do what we did the first six weeks obviously today was not not good enough at all but if are you so happen, harsh on your own evaluation You're saying you suck why do you say that because i did true it's been and uh i just i'm a fan i'm a fan awesome quarterback coach uh he's from the city next door uh, next door to me brad mandler really good dude great coach and he's also ethan grunkmeyer's coach he's got videos on his I'll put his handle up here. He's a good follow. He's got a lot of these quarterback videos from Ohio quarterbacks like Levi Davis, uh, Ethan Grunkmeyer, um, ton of quarterback videos, really cool stuff. But anyway, we know Penn State doesn't have a good receiving core. We know they have excellent running backs. They got a really solid defense, a peach of a schedule again. And that's the common theme here when, when I'm picking these playoff games or these playoff teams. It's the schedule. It's all about the schedule. They'll be favored against everybody but Ohio State. Their big games include West Virginia, if you can call that a big game, um, USC, Wisconsin, and Ohio State. West Virginia game, somewhat interesting. Wisconsin game, somewhat interesting. I think they'll show USC just exactly who is the boss of Tier 3 in the Big Ten. And uh, can't wait for that one. All right, number nine, Missouri. I really like Eli Drinkwitz. Uh, they got Brady back. They got Luther Burden's back. I mean, really good combo there. They actually got Mookie Cooper as well. So good wide receivers. Uh, LSU came and stole their defensive coordinator, Brady Baker. Missouri brought in Corey Batoon, who was uh, Kane Womack's defensive coordinator down at South Alabama. Um, he's now the, the Kane Womack is now Alabama's defensive coordinator, bringing that swarm defense up to uh, Alabama, which, you know, we've, we've talked about all week with Justin Hill and playing the wolf position. That's uh, Kane Womax. Well, his dad created the defense. But Justin Hill is going to go play that. Um, it's a little more exciting and cool sounding than the Jack, but whatever. We don't care anymore. We're done that or that, right? Missouri's a really good team. They're coming off a really good season. They're a veteran team. They're recruiting really well, and not that that means anything for this particular team, but it just means attitudes are great, energy is great around the program. Biggest thing is when you pair a veteran team coming off a successful season with a returning quarterback and a soft schedule, that's a recipe for success. Usually you're going to get yourself a good result. Let's take a look at this schedule. We start with four absolute gimmies. You got a test going to Texas A&M. You get Auburn at home. You're at Alabama, their biggest test of the year. You got Oklahoma at home. And the last three, pretty soft as well. We're talking Missouri is going to be favored in all but one game, pretty substantially in most. I think they might make the SEC title game, and even if they don't, I think they're going to make the playoffs. Uh, number 10, Ole Miss. This is the year for Lane Kiffin. Got his quarterback. Got in some quality transfers, impact players, Walter Nolan, Prince, whatever his last name is. I can't pronounce it. Uh, they're bigger and stronger up front. All, all SEC receiver from South Carolina. They got uh, two returning wide receivers, a tight end. Jackson darts the truth. Veteran team, man. It's a veteran team again. 
veteran team, soft schedule, proven quarterback coming off a good season, their first 11 win season. Schedule's cushy, just like Missouri. They start off with four ridiculous gimme wins Furman, Middle Tennessee, Wake Forest, Georgia Southern. Conference play Kentucky, South Carolina. They got big games at LSU, Oklahoma at home, then Georgia at home. End the season with beating up Florida and Mississippi State. These dudes got every doormat in the SEC that there's ever been. South Carolina, Kentucky, Mississippi State, Arkansas, and Billy Napier's Florida Gators. I mean, it couldn't be any easier than that. I don't think you can not pick these guys to be in the playoffs. Now, I don't know how you guys feel, but there is no coach that's done a 180 in my heart as much as Lane Kiffin. Ten years ago, I hated this guy with a passion smug, arrogant, cocky little bastard. And now I find all of the same behaviors kind of charming from him. And I don't really know how to explain that. Uh, let me know if you feel the same down in the comments. All right. 11 Clemson. It's Dabo's redemption year. He is uh, still rocking with a very talented roster last year, despite losing those four games, they were plus 92 yards per game, which means they lost a lot of odd ways. And they did. If you watched them, I've given up on Cade Klubnik ever being a superstar quarterback. That's not going to happen, but I do think he can be solid. They got big Phil Maffa, 235-pound beast of a back, averaged over five and a half yards per carry last year, and I like the way he runs. Uh, they were cooking there at the end. The ACC sucks. Basically, for me, this was choose between Florida State or Clemson because one of them is going to play Miami in the ACC championship. And I'm going to go with Clemson because I'm not a believer in Florida State this year. So I'm going to stick with them making the playoffs. I think they're going to run the table through the rest of the ACC. Uh, outside of the game number one against Georgia, they're going to be, what, 11-2 and two at the end of the year. So lose week one to Georgia, run out the rest of the schedule, losing the ACC championship to Miami. Clemson makes the playoffs. All right, in our first team out, Alabama. Alabama is our first team out. It's really only because of their schedule. It's really tough. But listen, I am now a believer in Kalen DeBoer as a coach. I guess I always have been as a coach. And that hypothetical question that we all had last year, who would you replace Ryan Day with? Most folks were picking Dan Lanning. I was picking Kalen DeBoer. It was really a coin flip for me. They're both excellent. They both got kind of a different skill set, though. But Kalen DeBoer, very experienced coach. He's a proven winner. Three NAIA national championships extensive experience as a head coach, knows how to run a program. Uh, everybody seems to love him. My issue with him was I didn't know if he had the chops to run a blue blood program. I think it takes a certain personality to run a program like in Ohio State, like in Alabama. I kind of feel like Ryan Day had to grow into that, learn how to do that. You look at a guy like Dan Lanning, absolute perfect personality fit to do that aggressive, kind of nasty, like Kirby, like Saban. Ryan Day needed to grow into that, and I think he has. I think he's there now. I think he's learned how to do it. But Kalen DeBoer reminded me of Ryan Day. Really good guy, just naturally isn't that kind of guy. Very smart, competent guy. Um, a guy that people absolutely like, not necessarily super cutthroat. This is just all my opinion of what I had of him heading down there. Uh, so I kind of doubted how he would be. And I certainly doubted him when it came to recruiting. And it first started out, we saw kids from Alabama and a lot of kids from South. They weren't signing there. And I said probably five times on this show, that the kids in the South are clearly taking a you've got to show me attitude with Kalen DeBoer, meaning we're going to watch and see you win first before we're going to go jump in to the boat at Alabama. That's what it looked like to me. That's clearly not what that's not what happened. <laughs> like they're they're jumping in head over heels to get in this class, his very first class. Their per player rating now higher than Ohio State's. Unbelievable. It's unbelievable. It truly is. I, I don't know what it is he's doing. 
that's got everybody so excited after they were previously did not appear to be so excited. I thought it was a mistake to bring Courtney Morgan with him. I thought he should have kept Sam Petito. I want to read you this. Where the hell is it? Sorry, I'm thumbing through my paperwork here. Um, we take a lot of notes for the show because if you want to have a good show, you have to put in the time. Okay. I don't know if I have a good show, but I want to have a good show. So I put in the time. Of course, if you put in that time, it would help if you found the notes while you were on the air. I have not. Um, my point is we'll get to recruiting in a minute, but it's absolutely just, it's a shock. It's a real shock in Alabama will be our first team out, but I do think that I was wrong about Kalen DeBoer not being successful at Alabama. And uh, I now think that, I guess maybe it was wishful thinking. I was hoping they would drop back to kind of that second tier. Um, and maybe it would be something like an Ohio State, Oregon, Georgia. And it will be this season, maybe the next season. But I think they're coming roaring back under this guy. I just do. All right, so our field is set. We've got all 12. Let's see what it looks like in bracket form, the official Juck on Bucks playoff bracket for the inaugural playoffs. We got the Buckeyes, Miami on one side of the bracket getting the bye. On the other side, Texas and the Utes, the two Utes. Now, Georgia and Ole Miss are going to play for the honor to match up with Texas. Notre Dame and Clemson, that's a matchup I always enjoy. Down at the bottom, we've got Oregon and Boise. That's a rematch. Oregon actually plays Boise at the beginning of the year. Then we've got Penn State and Missouri in a Lions versus Tigers battle for the opportunity to get eaten by the Buckeyes. And we advance to the next round. We see Georgia has beaten Ole Miss. They will now take on Texas. Notre Dame has beaten Clemson. They will take on Utah. Oregon had their bye week, and they will take on Miami. And Penn State beat Missouri. And we got a rematch in the Big Ten of Ohio State and Penn State, a rematch with Texas and Georgia as well. And moving right along, we are down to our final four as Ohio State has dispatched Penn State. Oregon has beaten Miami. Georgia has beaten Texas, and Utah has beaten Notre Dame. We've now got the Dogs versus the Utes and the Bucks versus the Ducks for the third time of the year. And into our championship game, we've got a rematch of the de facto championship game. Bucks versus Dogs. And of course, in the season of dreams, we know how this ends with the Buckeyes as our national champion in the inaugural 12-team playoff, just as they were in the inaugural 14-team playoff. Congratulations, Buckeyes, on the season of dreams. That's what it's going to be, guys. That's what it's going to be. I appreciate you playing along, and I hope you enjoyed my graphic. It took me forever. <laughs> um, Bill Kerlick had a little piece on Bucknuts. And it was basically inside the Justin Hill decision in the morning. So it said, Ohio State called one of Winton Woods football coach members before 10 a.m. on the day saying that they were hearing Hill may be picking Alabama. We know that Hill went totally radio silent. The Winton Woods staff member did not even have a definitive answer for that Ohio State staffer. In fact, even right after Hill announced his decision, he had not yet spoken with the coaching staffs at Ohio State. Oregon, or USC. He was planning to talk to those coaches from each school soon after the announcement and thank them for recruiting him, tell them how much he appreciated the three staffs, et cetera, on Friday. And that's how it ended for Justin Hill. And I'm telling you, I can't blame this dude for a second. I've thought about this situation. You've had these three relationships for a long time, particularly the one at Ohio State. You're one day before the decision. You're about to make the announcement. You've got your mind made up. Now, your top schools, obviously, they want to know what's going on. And they're going to be calling and talking to you a lot. These dudes, these coaches that have been recruiting you for a long time, like these are their livelihoods on the line. 
The pressure for those coaches is huge. The pressure as a 17-year-old to tell this grown-up that you are giving them really bad news, it's got to be immense. Immense pressure. I wouldn't want to have that conversation, and I certainly wouldn't want to have them trying to talk me out of it. That would go on forever. I mean, you would almost, I, I bet that there's a lot of times in those situations where parents got to get on the phone and be like, listen, he said no, he's done. Because, they, you know, they're pushing as hard as they can. It's probably like a breakup. When you're breaking up and you just want to get off the phone, you feel bad for them, but you can't get, like, you're just done hearing it. They keep pleading. You know what I mean? I don't know what that feels like, but I imagine it probably feels something like that. <laughs> I got a lot of comments this week. Um, particularly about, so after the Dorian Brew decision and after the Justin Hill decision, um, first off, we're not done recruiting him as though I was being some big negative Nancy. I wasn't being a negative Nancy. However, every loser in the battle from, I don't know, as long as I've been following recruiting says, we're not done recruiting him. Whatever. Yeah. Keep going. We know you're not done. You're going to try to flip him. We get it. Um, that's not a strategy. You took an L there. But I think what's more annoying are the people that act like voicing any amount of displeasure with a guy not choosing um, your favorite school is saying like you think that the sky is falling or the class sucks that you have. It's okay to think that both the class you have is awesome. And voice your displeasure in losing an in-state guy. You can do both things. You can think both things. Being upset about something or voicing disappointment, perfectly fine and normal. It's a real emotion. It's genuine. That's what I am. Uh, I express when I'm disappointed. I express when I'm grateful, when I'm appreciative. I express all the things. And quite frankly, the reason some people like me is because they say you're genuine, man. And I'm going to continue to be genuine. So, no, I was not throwing a hissy fit. I was not furious. Um, I was voicing my disappointment. And I will do that every time we lose out on a recruit for 24 hours. I'm allowed 24 hours. That's it. Um, that's the limit I give myself. And then we get back in gear and everything's great. And now we're going to talk about our fantastic class and who's still on the board, who came off the board. Damian Shanklin, defensive end from Indiana. He was pretty much identical to me on tape and in size to Ziggy Grady. We get Ziggy Grady out of Alabama. We don't get Damian Shanklin out of Indiana. He goes down to LSU. That makes both of the defensive guys that we wanted from Indiana go into an SEC school as Marion Dye, the bigger of the two, went to Tennessee. So we talked earlier on that these dudes were both pretty much infatuated with the SEC. It was either Ohio State or an SEC school. They both go and choose the SEC school. Doesn't really matter to us. Either one of them would have been a bonus because we got Ziggy Grady. We got London Merritt. We got Zaheer Mathis. So that would have just been gravy on top of those guys. All, uh, all rushers. I would have probably preferred Marion Die because he's bigger than, the, than those guys and uh, probably is going to end up getting bumped inside. Really athletic for a guy inside. Also off the board goes Andrew Stargell. Andrew Stargell, we offered as a center from Georgia. He committed to UCF. This was not an Ohio State loss on the trail. This was an Ohio State decision. Um, they decided to make it an either or between Jake Cook and Andrew Stargell. Uh, I have that confirmed now, um, 100%. And I think it's a bad decision, but you know, what are you going to do? Jake Cook can play guard. He's a 6'5", 290 pound road grader. He did not need to be the center. Stargell could have been the center. Stargell a little bit shorter. Um, but they decided they both needed to be a center. So no Stargell in the class means our only remaining targets at offensive line. Let's pull up the uh, offensive line data here. So we got in the class Carter Lowe and Jake Cook. And the only guys left are the guys in yellow. David Sanders and Javon McFadden. Josh Petty technically still left, but this is never, we've never been in this race for him. So if you get David Sanders, you've got David Sanders, Carter Lowe, and Jake Cook. 
I choose to think positively here, and I do think we are actually in the lead in most people's minds, that David Sanders is going to be a Buckeye. With David Sanders, Carter Lowe, who's just outside five-star, and when I say just, I mean one spot. Absolute stud. Maybe he gets to five-star. You're looking at two five-star offensive linemen and Jake Cook, the feel-good story of the class, who can also play some football. You still got Javon McFadden out there. He's not going to commit to the fall. A lot can happen between now and then. So really, who knows? It'd be kind of silly to project him in the class, but I do think he's a big-time Buckeye lean at this point. Uh, we see his other two schools are Colorado and Maryland, and that would sound right off the rip like it would be sillier for him to go to either of those schools. But his good buddy Jordan Seaton is at Colorado, and if Colorado starts off playing good, gets all you know boatload of attention again, who knows, man? He might want to go to Colorado. But if he does, and you got David Sanders, Carter Lowe, Jake Cook, obviously you're low on numbers, but we came into this thing thinking there was a possibility that they may only take three. If they do end up only taking three, no big deal. But as far as the talk, the buzz, uh, the targets, who's on the board, that's all I, that's all I know of. I, I don't know of anybody else that hasn't committed yet. Um, or that they're that they're in on that they're trying uh, to to flip seriously or they're probably trying to flip everybody. But trying to flip is is uh, you know it's it's a wing and a prayer. I mean a real plan. That's the only those are the guys that were planned. Um, and because of those low numbers, that's what also surprised me about uh, about pigeonholing Jake Cook and Stargell into both into the center position. But that's what we got. So. Wide receivers now with uh, obviously DeCorey and Moore off the board. Um, you still got uncommitted Jamie French, Vernell Brown, Dalen McCutcheon, and Philip Bell. Most likely for the Buckeyes left on that board, actually the only ones really still in play are Philip Bell and Dalen McCutcheon. Jamie French is going to Texas. Vernell Brown is going to Florida. Uh, there's really no shot at at the Buckeyes getting either of them because now Jamie French with no decorian and more in the picture for Texas, uh, th th there's nobody happier about that decision than Jamie French because Jamie French can now play this in such a way with Texas that he can make himself even more money and uh, he's going to do it. <laughs> that kid, man. Um, Vernell Brown obviously really loves Florida. The Buckeyes are not going to pay for either of those guys. They're just not. And I agree with it. I agree with the decision. You cannot, after just bringing in J.J. Smith with Chris Henry Jr. in the following class, who actually is exploring potentially reclassifying if he does. Um, honestly, I would rather he didn't. I'd rather he get another year of maturity. But then part of me is like, man. If we if he does now, then we can lock him in and not have to worry probably about it's going to be if it's a year out still, if he doesn't reclassify, it's going to get interesting, the recruitment for sure. But if he were to reclassify, I think the Buckeyes could probably lock him down much quicker. And that would obviously be nice. But if you stagger him out a, a year between him and JJ, I think it would be more advantageous for us to have a year between them. Plus, you give him a whole nother year to grow before he gets on campus. That's a plus, too. I mean, not that he needs to grow up, but just to get physically fuller, um, always a bonus. But, uh, you know, I agree with the strategy not paying for offense or for uh, wide receivers this cycle. All right. So, the remaining targets, let's check out the running backs. You've only got two on the board here. And Shakai Mills Knight, the running back out of uh, Tennessee who is somebody that the Buckeyes were in on earlier when Carlos Lachlan first came in from Oregon. He was the first guy he offered down at Tennessee. Big dude. I think he's going to play his college ball at about 6'2", 235. Love his running style. A little on the slower side, but he's a real banger. Uh, he's now scheduled for a visit July 29th. He visited Michigan recently. He is being pursued heavily and really likes Auburn and Tennessee, I think, the most right now. Maybe you'll miss two. They're all prioritizing him. None of them have three back classes. And Missouri or Ole Miss is about to, uh, well, they just did. They lost uh, Akeelan Deer. So I really don't 
think that this is going to be a legit possibility, but he's coming up for a visit, so you never know. Then you got Turbo Rogers, the Alabama commit. Now, Akilin Deer, who decommitted from Ole Miss, that's the number one back in the class, probably going to end up at Alabama the way they're going, which not only is going to boost their class tremendously, and their class is looking ridiculous now, but might help us with Turbo Rogers, but that still just makes two backs in the class. So with their momentum, with him being from Alabama, yes, he does have a long-time relationship with Carlos Lachlan. It still seems like a long shot to me. Riley Pettijohn, by the time you see this, we'll know what happened with Riley. Hopefully it's good news. Then we got Philip Bell and Vernell Brown. Vernell, it's a possibility still. It's a very low sh possibility, but it's a possibility. Philip Bell, down to USC and Ohio State. I think if Hartline wants him, he can get him, man. I really do, particularly with the wide receivers we have in this class. Then we got David Sanders and Javon McFadden. David Sanders, we're hearing towards uh, late August, he's going to make his decision. Javon in the fall. At defensive tackle, Malik Autry, the Auburn commit. We're trying our best with him. Jarquez Carter, I heard that we're going to take him regardless of the numbers, and it's not going to affect our pursuit of Malik Autry or Jakeem Stewart, but I think he wants to stay down south, most likely Miami. Then we got Trey McNutt and Messiah Delhomme, Trey McNutt. Not going to be coming, and I don't know what they're going to do about Messiah Delham. Uh, they they could probably close on him now if they want to, but I, I have a feeling they're holding out on McNutt. I don't know how long they can wait, though, before Delhomme uh, gets in a class, but I believe it's Virginia Tech and Maryland are his other two schools. So even if he does get in, if Ohio State comes calling, decent chance they could flip him towards the end there. So Justin Hill, uh, I was discussing with Chris on Menace to Sports when he was going to make his decision. Obviously, it was really buttoned up. The last minute crystal ball flips. Dude, listen. So after he announced, I watched uh, Wilt Fong had, had come on his little show and said that he talked to Justin Hill this morning. And Justin Hill had only told his brother, essentially his brother and Wilt Fong, and then an hour, what, it was like 12.03? Yeah. Wilt Fong puts up his crystal ball. Like, what is this, dude? You talk to the kid, and then you're going to put that up at 12.03 before he announces at 1 when he's kept it a secret this whole time? I think it's garbage. So Steve Wilt Fong did that to Justin Hill. I think it's pretty disgusting, particularly when you admitted that you knew the young man wanted to keep it a secret. And then you flip your crystal ball right before he announces, 45 minutes before he announces, and you steal his moment. It's just garbage, dude. It's total garbage. After he went through great lengths to keep it a secret, you blew it for him. Well, everybody ripped Steve Wiltfung to shreds, rightfully so. So, DeCorian Moore goes to make his decision. I'm sorry, that was Wednesday for Hill. So, DeCorian Moore goes to make his decision on Thursday. In one hour before he is set to announce his decision, college football journalist Pete Thamel, who's not even in the recruiting game, this isn't even his bag, puts out a tweet that Moore is set to announce to Oregon. He, well, actually, he said announced, past tense. He said DeCorian Moore announced he is committing to Oregon. Huge get for Dan Lanning and Junior Adams. Junior Adams, their wide receiver coach. So Moore commented on his post. I haven't told anybody nothing about any school. Who is this guy? Well, that guy's Pete Thamel. Uh, Michigan folks will tell you all about it. They really dislike him. <laughs> anyway, Thamel deletes the tweet. And I kind of think Pete Thamel made a mistake here. I don't think he was trying to do the crystal ball deal or break the news. I honestly think that he put that out there because he thought that he had already announced and what he was trying to do was talk about landing and junior Adams and Oregon recruiting. I don't think he was trying to break the news there, but the even, so but here's what makes it really bad is the Oregonian. DeCorian Moore nation's top wide receiver commits to Oregon comes out with this. Now this is all before his announcement and in their article, Dan Lanning and the Oregon Ducks reportedly made history Thursday night by landing the program's highest rated recruit ever. DeCorian Moore, the nation's number one wide receiver, according to 247 Sports Rankings, 
will commit to the Ducks, according to a now-deleted tweet from ESPN's Pete Thamel. Morris choosing between Oregon, Texas, LSU, and Ohio State. After Thamel deleted the tweet, Moore indicated on his account that he had not shared that information or talked to any reporter. So they admit that it was a deleted tweet and that Moore said that he didn't talk to any reporter, but still ran the story so that they could have the story. When he was about to announce 45 minutes later, the Oregonian couldn't just wait 45 minutes. These people are pathetic, dude. They're pathetic. Absolutely pathetic. But I have a college football podcast. I don't know, man. I I still don't call it a podcast. I call it a show. You guys call it a podcast. I still feel like a podcast is an audio version of a show. This is a show. I release it in podcast form. But my kids, everybody calls it a podcast. So whatever. I'll just go with podcast. So I have a college football podcast. And because I have a college football podcast, I have to do things that I don't normally want to do to stay up on the news. So honestly, I'll just start here. I I feel less bad for DeCorian Moore because this was his second announcement. He had his first one when he committed to LSU. So this was his second one. And you would think for your second one, maybe a little less pomp and circumstance. Not the case for DeCorian Moore. I watched this thing and it was supposed to happen at six. And it was on at six. It certainly did not happen at six. Um, He sat with his mom at a table. I think it was his mom. And she asked Twitter questions or something to him for what seemed like forever. Uh, it It was hard to watch, man, really. And let me tell you, this kid is not lacking on the stereotypical wide receiver ego. Um, That's for sure. But it was so long. Look at this. The TJ Saint right there. TJ Saint one says, uh, bro, teaching life lessons. Um, TJ Saint, Tavian Saint Clair. So that was pretty funny. Uh, Devin Sanchez popped in too and said he's about to uh, mess this live up and call him and find out where he's going. It was horrible. As good as the wide receiver kid is, the ego's as big as Texas. And boy, how about Texas, man? Oregon gets to Corey and more. So So he goes outside and the Wi-Fi is chopping in and out and like a big uh, gender reveal for a baby, instead of blue or pink, the fireworks blow up this box and out comes the green smoke. And the number one wide receiver in the country out of the state of Texas goes to Oregon, just like the Buckeyes pulled the number one cornerback out of the state of Texas, Devin Sanchez. Now, Texas. They got Arch Manning. They want Dort DeCorian more bad, desperately in Austin. They pulled out all the stops for him, like all the stops, and the Ducks still beat him. Now, some of the Ducks are clowning us today, but let's be honest. We all know we weren't really in this thing financially. When you're not in it financially, you're not really in it. And we have to factor this, this in, like when we're talking about recruiting battles, if you can afford to be in it financially and you choose not to, then you're not putting your best foot forward. Now, if we're talking about David Sanders, when we know we're all the way in as far as we can be financially, and you take an L, that's a straight-up L. But I can't really judge this as a straight-up L for the Buckeyes because we know they weren't pursuing him 100% with everything they had. And again, I agree with it. Um, But you're not really in the battle. So I don't really count this as the Buckeyes losing to Texas or Oregon. Uh, Texas, they were all the way in it. Texas lost. Oregon won this one. But uh, Oregon's wide receiver class now with two five stars with uh, DeCorian Moore and Dallas Wilson out of uh, Florida. It's sick, man. Their class is sick. With Dorian Brew as well. That's three five stars. But that's not it. They currently are trending for Trey McNutt. Trey McNutt, the number one uh, safety in the country. They're currently trending for Jonah Williams. That is technically he's the number one linebacker in the country, but he's going to be a safety. So that's two five stars. Um, The top available cornerback on the board, DJ Pickett out of Florida. He's a five star. 
number three cornerback in the country, and he is trending to Oregon as well. And then the number one athlete in the country, Michael Terry the third, I think he's trending to Oregon as well. He's a five star as well. That's four five stars that are uh, currently trending to Oregon. They got three in the class already. I had my buddy Max Torres on a little while back. It was probably about three months ago now. He's been covering Oregon a long time. Um, now he covers Oregon recruiting for On3. And this is a snippet of the conversation Max and I had. So Oregon has always, not always, but for the last 10 years has recruited very well. Uh, nothing like underlanding, though. It, it feels like he kind of came in and said, we don't have to settle right here. We can go after the number one, number two guys in every position group. And everywhere I look, Oregon is in on the top guys Ohio State is in on. And they're not just in on like they offer. They're in on these guys are talking highly about Oregon. And and uh, it, it's, it's a different feel to me when it comes to recruiting from Oregon. Uh, have you noticed the same thing? Yes and no. Um, I think that Mario Cristobal really kind of laid the blueprint for this. And you could also even talk about Willie Taggart before. Okay, we can stop right now. <laughs> I was right. Max was trying to tamp it down a little bit. Um, yeah, this is totally different. This is nothing like Oregon's ever seen. Uh, we're not talking Willie Taggart or Mario Cristobal levels of recruiting in Oregon where they may actually land a five-star, maybe two. Um, this is, we're talking Alabama, Ohio State, a good class level recruiting. They, let's say realistically, they don't land all four of those guys. Let's say they land two. You're looking at five, five-star prospects in a class. Um, anytime we do that, like that's, that's a number two class. We've never hit number one. We have hit five, five stars. We actually one year hit seven, five stars, which was just bananas. And we did not win, but we did win the per player average that year. Um, Oregon currently second per player average, 94.10. Alabama, 94.11. Buckeyes are now third. But by the time you hear this, they may have jumped back up as we are, you know, looking at a five star right now uh, about to commit that we're going to go uh, live with on at 12 o'clock on Saturday in Riley Pettit, John, he's a five star that may raise it, but uh, to be in on four or five stars right now, it's insane. What Oregon has done is insane and recruiting is uh, it's just different now, man. It's different. You still have to, as a prerequisite, do all the recruiting relationship building Everything you had to do before, you still have to do all that and you still got to win all that. But now you win all that for a seat at the table to then enter the financial battle. And it is very clear that the landing staff can not only do the first part expertly, but it doesn't look like anybody is. Um, beating them in the second part. The second part, the financial part, they seem to just be kind of closing left and right, man. And it's something. You look at Kalen DeBoer down in Alabama, the kind of steam he's got, and what happens when he starts winning? And Georgia's still doing Georgia things. They're growing the great talent, and they're keeping the ones they really want home. And then they're going and picking off around the country wherever they want. So are the Buckeyes. And it's those four teams. Ohio State, Oregon, Alabama, and Georgia. The rosters, not so much Alabama's yet, but it will be. The Georgia, Oregon, and Ohio State rosters. They're almost whole lists, right? They just, they're just flawless. Rosters, there's no holes. We're not used to seeing multiple teams like that. This is different. This is nothing like we've ever seen. And as we head into the first real playoff, four teams is not a playoff. That's a plus one. Now we have a real playoff. But let's be honest. The past 20 years, the past 50 years, 
This playoff would have been boring in terms of the winner. And what I mean is, we've had years, a lot of them, in that 14 playoff, where we couldn't find four worthy teams. Where there was a foregone winner right at the beginning, and we all knew it. There was one team standing head and shoulders above the rest, or there was two. Once in a while, there was maybe a little less separation between the top one, and then maybe there were two more right behind them. Very rarely was there four worthy teams that you could see winning at all. But now as we've seen what's going on, this is the first real cycle in recruiting with unregulated pay for play after a couple of years of NIL. But this is no longer NIL. This is straight up pay for play. There are no regulations here. These guys aren't getting fake inflated car dealership deals to advertise their product. They're just getting paid and there's no salary cap. And like I said, I'm not trying to take away from anybody. You still got to do the work in the recruiting. And it's clear from what the parents are saying that divorce staff in Alabama and landing staff in Oregon are both really killing it in that aspect, as are the Buckeyes, as always, as is Georgia, as always. But man, what we just saw at Georgia, at uh, Oregon, and what we're continuing to see. It's uh, it's a it's a program that has leveled up to a level they've never been before, and it is now upper echelon. In Alabama, Georgia, and Ohio State, if we look back when they were just running things, just the three of them at the top of the board every year, pretty much, they miss on recruits at the same rate as everybody else. They just have more. They have more elite recruits. So when you miss, it didn't hurt you as much. Now, if you recruit at that top level, that insane clip that those three have recruited at for a good while now, and you miss, you just backfill in the portal like Ohio State did with six or seven portal guys. Georgia did the same exact thing. Oregon took about 16 guys in the portal this past year. They won't need to next year. They'll be the exact same way. And these rosters at these programs are going to pretty much continue, if this system stays as is, just remain flawless. Just perfect rosters across the board with these top four. I do believe Alabama is going to be there soon. But when you can go into the transfer portal only needing to fill six or seven roster spots or upgrade at six or seven spots, dude, that's, a, that's an impeccable roster. We've just not seen this. We've not seen rosters this complete. They all look like an Alabama roster in peak save in Alabama. Like they all look like where every single group, what did I say? Oregon's the one, the one group there's a question mark would be the secondary. And they got a first round corner. You know what I mean? We've not seen this before. And it's, it's weird. <laughs> and these playoffs, I think that the Oregon, Alabama, Ohio State and Georgia. Unfortunately, this happens for us in a year where we have one of our best rosters ever, that there are also two more teams that have rosters that are very complete like ours. I still think ours is the best. But it does suck because our roster in almost any other year for the past 10 years feels like to me it would be very much head and shoulders, a clear-cut number one roster. Now, a roster doesn't win you the national championship. The team wins you the national championship, the coaching. Um, but just as far as talent, man, these rosters are, are going to get at a certain level where nobody can touch them. These four teams right here, Alabama, Ohio State, Oregon, and Georgia. And I feel like they are going to absolutely run and dominate the second decade or, or the first uh, five years of this playoff, this, the second half of this decade. Texas, I think, is close. And if you talk about those five teams, just look at the five stars this year. I think they have like 22. 22 of the five stars go to those top five teams. Um, the talent isn't spreading out. The talent is consolidating. And it's consolidating with the powers of college football. And uh, Oregon got in. Alabama doesn't look like they're going to drop off. And I think that's what we're at here. So I'm officially getting more and more excited for this playoff and for this season. 
You want to talk about Oregon's wide receiver room? So Oregon gets DeCorian Moore and Dallas Wilson this cycle, two five stars. They're coming off of Jeremiah McClellan and Gatlin Bear. Gatlin Bear, another five star. He's on, uh, I believe, uh, um, what do you call it? A missionary trip. Might be two years, might be one year. Cycle before that, they had five star Jury and Dickey. Um, and, and they've got more really talented wide receivers. Their wide their wide receiver room, and I I mean we're not talking just the starters, like their entire wide receiver room is is looking like a uh, peak Brian Hartline wide receiver room. Like it's 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 almost looking like that. It's incredible. But Jesse Simonton goes over, coaches under pressure. So in the ACC, Dabo Swinney, hi. So Jesse Simonton of On3 went through all the conferences and listed all the coaches and what level of pressure they were under. There was no uh, criteria for this pressure. Some, some of it's pressure because, like the Ryan Day pressure, you have a good roster, now you need to win with it. Some of it's pressure like you might get fired. So Dabo Swinney, he's got as high pressure. Mike Norvell. He has as high pressure. Mike Norvell was undefeated last year. I don't understand that one bit. Mario Cristobal, he has extreme pressure. Uh, he's 12 and 13 in two seasons. Says he needs nine to 10 wins. I think he'll get it, obviously. I, I've, I've said that for a while. But one thing that buys you time is talent. And they're excited in Miami to have a classic Miami looking roster. It's the best in the ACC with a lot of talent. I don't think he's under extreme pressure at all. Mac Brown. Mac Brown in his 16th season now in his second stint at North Carolina. Mac Brown is only 73. That surprised me. I thought Mac was a little older than that. I don't know. Maybe it's just been because he's had white hair for so long. But Mac Brown uh, under a high amount of pressure, as is Pat Narduzzi at Pitt. And Narduzzi is just a volatile kind of jerk. And I'm surprised he's still there, to be honest. In the SEC, Kalen DeBoer. He's got under high amount of pressure. I kind of agree. And I just agree because if he comes out and loses a bunch of games, they're just going to freak out on him. Not the ones that listen to Juck on Bucks. The irrational Alabama fans. They're going to say he's the wrong guy. You know how they'll be. Um, the same way we would be if we uh, hired somebody and he came in and lost five games in his first year. Sam Pittman in Arkansas, extreme pressure. This one's hilarious, man. So obviously Sam Pittman started off pretty good, and then he's been 11 and 14 in his last two seasons. They brought in Bobby Petrino. And I cannot, first off, I hate calling a grown man Bobby. Um, Bobby Bowden's the only grown man I'm comfortable calling Bobby. But to bring Bobby Petrino back after what happened there, with him and to have him work under Sam Pittman. And he's basically like a vulture sitting there for Sam Pittman, waiting for him to get fired. It's really weird. It's a really strange situation. Kirby smart, medium pressure. I, uh, to, to, to say that Kirby is under any kind of pressure is hilarious in the big 10 Ryan day, extreme pressure. The only two extremes I saw, Ryan Day and Mario Cristobal. P.J. Fleck, he's got him on the hot seat if he doesn't do good this year. P.J. Fleck, 9-4, and 9-4, and four, then 6-7 and seven in his last three seasons. He's 4-0 and oh in bowl games at Minnesota. I don't really know any Minnesota fans, but I don't think they expect a whole lot out of the Golden Gophers. I think 9-4 and four in a bowl win in consecutive years can buy you a couple six and seven seasons. I don't know, man. It's Minnesota after all. James Franklin, hi. I can see that. But then again, I don't know, man. They all seem content with him. I, I don't know what it is about Penn State fans. I feel like they, they should be so much more demanding than they are of their team. Of course, they're not anywhere near as supportive of their team uh, when we talk about the financial part of it. We went through those figures. 60 or 57 million dollars given to 
by boosters to the Ohio State football program. That's not including NIL. That's the athletic department. Thirty-one million at Michigan, seven million at Penn State, and they should obviously, with uh, the size of the alumni, which is bigger than Ohio State, Michigan, it's the biggest alumni association in the world, should absolutely be beating Ohio State or Michigan because they're coming from behind trying to finally get over the hump. Billy Napier obviously is under extreme pressure. Billy Napier, 11 and 14 in two seasons. And I almost feel bad for Billy Napier having those two horrible seasons at Florida. Coming in, you get the new facilities. The place looks great. You get DJ Lagway. He looks like a, he's going to be a superstar. He, he's going to be really, really good. Recruiting's looking up. And then you get this schedule. And I, I kind of hope they give him some grace with this schedule because it's just one of the hardest schedules I can ever recall. I don't mean this year. I mean ever. It is so stout that it's going to be fun, and it's going to be really fun watching them play this year. Did I just say that about Florida? I did. I think I mean it. I think it's going to be fun rooting for them every week to uh, to not lose seven games because I don't think they're a seven-loss team. Brian Kelly, he's got him on high pressure. Back-to-back uh, -back double-digit wins uh, to start his career at LSU. I don't think he's so much under high pressure. I do think it's hilarious that Notre Dame's probably going to make the playoffs this year and LSU is not. That's what I find hilarious. Um, I also think it's hilarious that Marcus Freeman is recruiting better this year than Brian Kelly ever did in his uh, third cycle. That's hilarious as well. Lane Kiffin has him under high pressure. Lane Kiffin, 11-2 uh, and two last year, best year ever. I don't know where that's coming from. Anyway, let's get to some comments and wrap her up. I got to log out of here soon so we can uh, break down some Pettijohn tape and get ready for our decision time at noon. All right. Why not the best wide receiver in the country? Sco Ducks. And the Ducksters are talking smack to me. Don't they know? Don't. Uh, Josh R2280 says, Ohio kids just don't want to play for Ohio State. Day's another Cooper. Exact copy is such a bad look. Buddy, come on now. I disagree. I don't think that's the case. I don't think that's the case at all. And I do think he's prioritizing Ohio kids too. I, I just don't, I think that this crop of dudes is, is just different. They're, they're not like they used to be. They all want to be national. They don't want you to even assume that they should be loyal to Ohio state. They want to have an even slate for everybody. We've definitely seen that with Justin Hill. We're definitely seeing it with Trey McNutt. I don't know if you can really, Dorian Brew is a totally different situation. He wasn't even living in Ohio. He is an Ohio kid. Um, that was 100% um, more of a money war than a fit war for Dorian Brew. Eric says, my thoughts on OSU defense is Larry Johnson won't allow the Jack position to be a thing because he's bullheaded and always wants four defensive linemen on the field. Well, it's an interesting perspective. Let's hear what Larry Johnson thinks about the Jack position. Which my guys, man? <laughs> and the Jack is in, in discussion. I have no idea. I just go coach my guys, man. <laughs> oh, okay. I have no idea. So you're not coaching the Jack? I know well, the Jack is could be a, could be a linebacker. I know. I don't know. So yeah. I, who knows? Okay. Who knows? So. Thank you, Larry. Because it's secret. And the Jack is. Let's watch that one more time. Coach my guys, man. <laughs> When the Jack is in, in discussion. I have no idea. I just go coach my guys, man. Oh, okay. I have no idea. So you're not coaching the Jack? I, I, I know the Jack is, could, be a, could be a linebacker. I know. I don't know. So yeah. I, who knows? Who okay. knows? So. Thank you, Larry. Because it's secret. When the Jack is. Eric, I think you might be on to something, buddy. Doesn't sound like Larry uh, knows what the Jack is or wants anything to do with the Jack. <laughs> Oh, boy. Rudy Harvey says, Chuck, what do you think Oregon would have to do to become OSU's main rival over Michigan, or does that rivalry run so deep that it's not possible? 
Um, I mean, no, it's not possible. It's uh, It could be a great rivalry between Ohio State and Oregon, but it would never be so hateful and personal. Number one, because you live so far away. Number two, because of the history. We fought a war with them. You know what I mean? No. The only shots were fired were a couple shots up in the air. Uh, somebody did get stabbed, but uh, we fought a war over a city, city that nobody wants anymore. <laughs> and uh, they actually, so we actually won that war. I believe the war was 1825. It was when they first applied for state statehood. And we fought this war over Toledo. And uh, in consolation, they got, I think, two thirds of the upper peninsula of Michigan which is now probably pretty valuable. It's really beautiful country. And uh, Ohio got Toledo, which, you know, I'm from Akron, so I can't talk a whole lot of junk about Toledo, but um, a lot of people compare the two, but uh, Akron's the best. Curtis Scrugg says, come on, man. The missed on this young man, but that's okay. Who has the number one class in the country? Well. Um, if they continue on the route they're on, they might get it. Alabama might get it. Ohio state might get it. Uh, having the number one class in the country at any point until the end, none of that matters. Nonetheless, um, like I said, it's okay to be disappointed. It's all right. You're allowed to be disappointed and still recognize that you have the number one class and still be happy with what you have. My wife always tries to teach me that be happy with what you have. Don't worry about the misses. I mean, worry about the misses her. Yes, definitely worry about her, the misses. I mean, the, the ones you miss out on. Um, and I don't, but I generally, you know, for a day or so, when it's an in-state guy uh, that, that should be a Buckeye, in my opinion, that's going to make me salty, and I will not bite my tongue. Uh, Samuel Wilkins says, uh, Bama fan, love watching Zone 6 do their thing. Carnell, Brandon Innes, and Kojo going to get their PT. I know it. Good luck to you all this season. Please take care of Kayla Downs for us. Beat that team up north. Um, wow, dude. I'm going to say it. I did that episode, the Justin Hill Live. Guys, we had a whole lot of great Bama fans that tuned in, uh, offering us kind of a an olive branch. Pretty cool. And then we had some not-so-cool ones. You took Caitlin down. You thought we forgot. So, not. Not the coolest ones also in there as well. Texas is freaking out, man. The Texas fans are freaking out. I, uh, just for a little fun, went and checked out some of their message boards. <laughs> Listen, I can't say it wasn't a little bit enjoyable uh, watching, watching Oregon beat them because, uh, you know, if you think Oregon's a is an obnoxious fan base. Texas, when they're rolling, they're they're pretty obnoxious. Oregon, not, not quite anything like them. But there is a lot of uh, a lot of call us a blue blood now. We want to be a blue blood. I'm seeing a lot of that on the Twitter, uh, and that's just like you know. I'll have to say this till I'm blue in the face, till I'm an old man. I guess I, mean, I kind of am an old man. There are eight historical blue bloods. There can be no new blue bloods. You can make a new name. But Blue Bloods refer to those eight teams, and that's that. That's just it. That, t that term is just so bastardized. Like That's what that term means. You can't just go changing definitions for things. I don't know, man. Nobody understands, guys. Just us. Now, there is one more video that I want to show you. Let me find that turkey. All right, I'm going to play you this video. This is the number one back in the country. Take a look at him. Go! 
Now, what did you think of him? The number one back in the country. And I've been telling you guys ever since he came on the scene that you don't need to worry about Jordan Davison because Isaiah West is the number one back in the country, whether he's rated that or not. And that's who you just watched. So next time, just believe me off the film. That dude is the truth. All right, guys, that'll do me for. Thank you so much for watching Juck on Bucks, my mom's favorite college football shows, soon to be your mom's. I will talk to you later. Please like the show, share it with a friend. Until next time, Juck on Bucks out. We can lollygag, we can putz around, or we can just go right through. I mean, we all know it's a foregone conclusion where the season of dreams is going, and that's where it goes. It was written in the stars all along. We call it the season of dreams for a reason. Buckeyes win.